Lesson 4 for October 19 through 25, Facing Opposition. Sabbath afternoon, October 19. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus lived and died and rose again, that each of us could have eternal life, and that he's coming back again soon. And as we share that message with those around us, as we live our lives in the communities in which we live, we know that there will be times of opposition to what is truth, but also opposition to our own personal ideas. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us on this lesson dealing with what to do with opposition. Bless us now as we look at the lives of Ezra and Nehemiah again. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ezra chapter 5 verse 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. Let's read that again, Ezra chapter 5 and verse 5. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. Ezra chapter 3 through to chapter 6 is structured thematically, covering different historical periods of opposition to the rebuilding of the temple. Recognising this thematic approach will help clarify the overall message. Ezra is mentioned for the first time by name in Ezra chapter 7 verse 1. With his arrival in 457 BC, things changed and the city of Jerusalem, with its wall, began to be spasmodically rebuilt. Thirteen years later, Nehemiah arrived, sent by Artaxerxes in 444 BC, and the building of the wall was finally resumed. Although the opposition was intense, the work was completed in 52 days, as we read in Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. Resistance to the work of God is a prevalent theme in the two books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Therefore, it is not surprising that rebuilding the temple and Jerusalem incited opposition and persecution. Wherever we turn in today's world, the word of the Lord is resisted. Satan tries to make sure that the gospel doesn't spread quickly, as it threatens his dominion. In Ezra and Nehemiah, how did the Jews handle the opposition? Sunday, October 20. Opposition begins. Question. Read Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Why do you think the Israelite remnant refused the help of other people in building the temple? Ezra 4, beginning at verse 1. Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord, God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, You may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus the king of Persia has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counsellors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. On the surface, the request seemed like a kind, neighbourly thing to do. So why turn down the help? 
In one sense, the answer is found in the text itself. The adversaries came to offer them help. Adversaries? That alone gives a powerful hint as to why the Israelites reacted as they did. Why were the people called adversaries? Second Kings chapter 17 verses 24 to 41 explains that these people were imported from other nations into Samaria and the surrounding region after the northern kingdom Israelites were deported. Let's look at that. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 17 beginning at verse 24. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Cutha, Ava, Hamath, and from Shephavaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. And it was so, at the beginning of their dwelling there, that they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. So they spoke to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations whom you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the rituals of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and indeed they are killing them, because they do not know the rituals of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Send there one of the priests whom you brought from there. Let him go and dwell there, and let him teach them the rituals of the God of the land. Then one of the priests, whom they had carried away from Samaria, came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. However, every nation continued to make gods of its own, and put them in the shrines on the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in the cities where they dwelt. The men of Babylon made Succoth Binoth, the men of Cuth made Nergal, the men of Hamath made Ashima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sephavites burned their children in fire to Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of Sephavaim. So they feared the Lord. And from every class they appointed for themselves priests of the high places, who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. They feared the Lord, yet served their own gods, according to the rituals of the nations from among whom they were carried away. To this day they continue practicing the former rituals. They do not fear the Lord, nor do they follow their statutes or their ordinances or the law and commandment which the God had commanded the children of Jacob, whom he had named Israel, with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, You shall not fear other gods, nor bow down to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice to them. But the Lord, who brought you up from the land of Egypt with great power and an outstretched arm, him you shall fear, him you shall worship, and to him you shall offer sacrifice." And the statutes, the ordinances, the law, and the commandment which he wrote for you, you shall be careful to observe forever. You shall not fear other gods. And the covenant that I have made with you, you shall not forget. Nor shall you fear other gods. But the Lord your God you shall fear, and he will deliver you from the hand of all your enemies. However, they did not obey, but they followed their former rituals. So these nations feared the Lord, yet served their carved images. Also their children and their children's children have continued doing as their fathers did, even to this day. The king of Assyria sent them priests, who were to teach them how to worship the God of the land, that is, the God of Israel. However, the resulting religion incorporated the Canaanite gods as well. Therefore, the remnant Israelites were afraid that this religion would be brought into their temple worship. Hence, the best and smartest thing to do was what they did, which was to say, no thank you. We have to remember, too, just why all this was happening to begin with. It was their forefathers' constant compromise with the pagan faiths around them that led to the destruction of the temple, as well as to their exile. Presumably, while in the very process of building the temple anew, the last thing that they would want to do would be to get too closely aligned with the people around them. 
question. What else in these texts shows why this refusal was the right thing to do? Ezra 4, verses 4 and 5. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building and hired counsellors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so to finish the day, think about how easily they could have rationalised accepting this help. What does Second Corinthians 6.14 have to say to us in this context? Second Corinthians 6 verse 14, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness? Monday, October 21. Prophets Encourage Unfortunately, the opposition that the Jews encountered from the surrounding nations, as described in Ezra chapter 4 through to chapter 6, left them afraid and unwilling to work on the temple. As mentioned before, Ezra chapter 4 verse 6 through to 622 is not written in chronological order. Therefore, we will look at chapter 5 before chapter 4. Question. Read Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Why does God send the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to the Jews? What is the result of their prophesying? Ezra 5, beginning at verse 1. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josiah, rose up and began to build the house of God which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. At the same time, Tatanai, the governor of the region between the river and Shetha Bosnai, and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them. Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Then, accordingly, we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. The Jews had stopped building because they were afraid. But God had sent them to Judah to rebuild the temple and the city, and he had a plan. Since they were afraid, he had to do something in order to encourage them. Therefore, he called two prophets to step in. Human opposition doesn't stop God. Even if the Jews contributed to this opposition by their own actions, God did not abandon them. He worked through the prophets to motivate and propel them into action again. Question. Read Haggai chapter 1. What is the message for them? And what can we take away from this for ourselves? Haggai chapter 1 Verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withheld the dew, and the earth withheld its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, and the Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 573 and 574, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah were raised up to meet the crisis. In stirring testimonies, these appointed messengers revealed to the people the cause of their troubles. The lack of temporal prosperity was the result of a neglect to put God's interests first, the prophets declared. Had the Israelites honoured God, had they shown him due respect and courtesy by making the building of his house their first work, they would have invited his presence and blessing. Tuesday, October 22. Work Stoppage. Question, what did the enemies do in Ezra chapter 4, verses 6 through to 24, in order to stop the work in Jerusalem? Let's read Ezra 4, beginning at verse 6. In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Artaxerxes also, Bilshlam, Mithridath, Tabel, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and translated into the Aramaic language. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to king Artaxerxes in this fashion. From Rehum, the commander... Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their companions, representatives of the Danites, the Ephesathites, the Tarpalites, the people of Persia and Erech and Babylon and Shushan, the Dehavites and the Elamites, and the rest of the nations whom the great and noble Osnapper took captive and held in the cities of Samaria and the remainder beyond the river, and so forth. This is the copy of the letter that they sent him. To King Artaxerxes, from your servants, the men of the region beyond the river, and so forth. Let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem, and are building the rebellious and evil city, and are finishing its walls and repairing its foundations. Let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute or custom, and the king's treasury will be diminished. Now, because we receive support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see the king's dishonour. Therefore, we have sent and informed the king that search may be made in the book of the records of your fathers." And you will find in the book of the records and know that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings and provinces, and that they have incited sedition within the city in former times. 
for which cause this city was destroyed. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the result will be that you will have no dominion beyond the river. The king sent an answer to Rehum the commander, to Shimshai the scribe, to the rest of their companions who dwell in Samaria, and to the remainder beyond the river, peace, and so forth. The letter which you sent to us has been clearly read before me, and I gave the command, and a search has been made, and it was found that this city in former times has revolted against kings, and rebellion and sedition have been fostered in it. There have also been mighty kings over Jerusalem who have ruled over all the region beyond the river, and tax, tribute, and custom were paid to them. Now give the command to make these men cease, that this city may not be built until the command is given by me. Take heed now that you do not fail to do this. Why should damage increase to the hurt of the kings? Now, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews, and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. The people of the land wrote letters of accusation against the Jews and their work first to Darius, which you read about in Ezra chapter 5 and chapter 6, then to King Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, as well as Artaxerxes. They were doing everything in their power to stop the work in Jerusalem. The people of the surrounding nations claimed that if the city were rebuilt, the king would lose his power over it, because Jerusalem had always been a place of rebellion and trouble in the past. Unfortunately, King Artaxerxes was swayed into believing that the Jews were building only because they wanted to gain their independence and therefore incite confrontation. He ordered the work to cease, and the people sent an army to prevent further building of the city. This forceful approach brought the work for God to a halt. Question. Read Ezra 4, verses 23 and 24 again. Why did the Jews stop building? Didn't they know that God wanted them to rebuild the city? What got in the way? Ezra 4 Beginning at verse 23, Now when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews, and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God which is at Jerusalem ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. It is apparent that the Jews realized that God had called them to rebuild the city and the temple, but, because of the strong opposition, they were afraid. Perhaps they came up with such excuses as, now must not be the right time, or, if this were truly what God wanted us to do, he would have provided a way, or, maybe we weren't supposed to come back here at all. When opposition gets in the way of doing what we believe God calls us to do, we have the tendency to question and doubt God's guidance. We can easily convince ourselves that we made a mistake. Fear can paralyze our minds and our thoughts turn to despair and helplessness instead of being focused on the power of God. So to finish the day, Have you experienced something similar, being convinced that God has called you to do something and then harbouring doubts when things got hard? Think, for instance, about John the Baptist. What have you learned from that experience? Wednesday, October 23, Nehemiah takes action in 444 BC. 
Question, read Nehemiah chapter 4. What did the Jews do under Nehemiah's leadership to stand up to opposition? Why was it important for them to prepare themselves to fight rather than just do nothing, believing that God would protect them? Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. But it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn your reproach on their own heads, and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity, and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have proved you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together as up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work." Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs and Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, The strength of the labourers is falling, and there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And all our adversaries said, They will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was, when the Jews who dwelt near them came, that they told us ten times, From whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall, at the openings, and I set the people according to their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked, and arose, and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses." And it happened, when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, every one to his work. So it was, from that time on, that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armour. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. Then I said to the nobles, the rulers, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from one another on the wall. Wherever you heard the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we laboured in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, Let each man and his servants stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing." After starts and stops, the people began working again. The Jews prayed, and then Nehemiah set up an active guard. The people rotated through shifts during the day and night time in order to be prepared for any looming attacks. Nehemiah also organized the people around the wall with weapons so that each family was ready to fight. 
Additionally, he divided his servants into two groups, with one working and the other holding weapons. There also were special provisions for all those who worked on the wall, as they were closest to the danger. Each one of the builders held a sword with one hand, and with the other added bricks or stones and mortar to the wall. They were prepared to face the opposition. They did their part. God did the rest. Nehemiah's faith in God's protection is inspiring. However, he didn't sit on the couch and expect God to do everything. They prepared by doing the best of their abilities. The two passages, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses, in chapter 4 of Nehemiah, verses 13 and 14, and Our God will fight for us, in verses 19 and 20, are some of the most inspirational statements found in the Bible. The Jews could have stopped building once again because of the persistent opposition. But this time, instead of being overcome by fear, they held on to the promise that God would fight for them. When we encounter opposition to the name of God, to our beliefs or to what God calls us to do, we should remember that God will fight for us. In the end, the Jews realised that the Lord was behind what they were doing, and this gave them the courage to press on ahead. So, To finish the day, why is it so important to know that what you are doing is God's will? Thus, an important question to ask is, how do I know if what I am doing is God's will? Thursday, October 24. Doing a great work. Question. Read Nehemiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 13. Why does Nehemiah see the work he is doing in Jerusalem as a great work in verse 3? What were the attempts in this case to stop him? Nehemiah 6, beginning at verse 1. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servant to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumours, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king, so come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I said to him, saying, No such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Afterward I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer, and he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, Should such a man as I flee... And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. 
Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. Chapter 6 describes many attempts on Nehemiah's life. Sanballat and Geshem kept sending Nehemiah letters in order to get him to come to them under the pretext of a meeting. However, the meeting was in the plain of Ono, which was in enemy territory, and thus gave away the true intent of the invitation. Sanballat, Tobiah and Geshem see a window of opportunity that will last only until the wall is finished and the gates are shut. The Jews have the protection of the Persian king, and therefore their enemies cannot conquer them through a full frontal attack. But if they get rid of the leader, they will stunt the progress or perhaps even stop the Jews forever. They are not giving up. Even if Nehemiah is not responding, they keep trying. It must have been frustrating to Nehemiah to have to deal with opposition at every turn. He responds to them by saying, I am doing a great work, in verse 3. By the world standard, Nehemiah was doing a great work as a cupbearer for the king, which was a prestigious occupation, one of the highest in the land, where he served as an advisor to the king. But building a city that was in ruins, that had no apparent worldly significance? That's what he calls a great work. Nehemiah considered the work for God as great, and more important because he realized that the honor of God's name was at stake in Jerusalem. Also, when God set up the sanctuary services, he instituted the priesthood. In order to keep the sanctuary holy and special in the minds of the people, he allowed only the priests to perform the duties inside the temple. On our own, we have a hard time seeing the holiness of God. Therefore, God made provision to help the Israelites come into the presence of God with reverence. Nehemiah knew that temple courts were for everyone, but not the inner rooms. By his words about meeting inside the temple, Shemaiah not only shows himself to be a false prophet by suggesting something that was contrary to God's directive, but he also exposes himself as a traitor. So to finish the day. What are ways that we today, with no earthly sanctuary, can keep before us a sense of God's holiness? How does the realization of God's holiness, in contrast to our sinfulness, drive us to the cross? Friday, October 25. Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 644. The opposition and discouragement that the builders in Nehemiah's day met from open enemies and pretended friends is typical of the experience that those today will have who work for God. Christians are tried not only by the anger, contempt and cruelty of enemies, but by the indolence, inconsistency, lukewarmness and treachery of avowed friends and helpers. And page 660 from the same book, Prophets and Kings, in Nehemiah's firm devotion to the work of God and his equally firm reliance on God lay the reason of the failure of his enemies to draw him into their power. The soul that is indolent falls an easy prey to temptation, but in the life that has a noble aim and absorbing purpose, evil finds little foothold. The faith of him who is constantly advancing does not weaken, for above, beneath, beyond, he recognizes infinite love, working out all things to accomplish his good purpose. God's true servants work with a determination that will not fail because the throne of grace is their constant dependence. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 
One, put yourself in the position of Zerubbabel and Joshua and the other leaders when those men came to them with the offer of help. Looking back now, we can see that they did the right thing by not accepting that offer. As Adventists, how can we know when we should and should not collaborate with others not of our faith? How do we decide if it is right or wrong? What criteria can we follow? And two... All through biblical history, we see the dangers of compromising our faith with the world. Indeed, the whole history of ancient Israel, right up to the Babylonian captivity, was a powerful example of this compromise. At the same time, what happens when people go to extremes to try to avoid that danger? When Jesus himself was accused of violating the Sabbath in John 9 verses 14 to 16, do we not have a powerful example of his accusers going to the other extreme? How do we find the right balance? John 9 beginning at verse 16, now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Money for Missionaries and it's by Horatio Rizzo. The plan was ambitious. Send 25 missionary couples from South America to share the gospel in the countries of the 1040 window. I listened intently as Erton Kohler, president of the South American Division, presented the Missionaries to the World initiative to 80 Seventh-day Adventist leaders from across South America at the division headquarters in Brazil's capital, Brasilia, in 2014. Pastor Kohler spoke about the challenges the Adventist Church has faced in the Middle East, and he mentioned a lack of financial and human resources. Our division can help by sending 25 married couples and covering all their expenses, including airfare, food and insurance, for five-year terms. Pastor Kohler invited us to support the initiative financially. Each of us served as the president of a conference or mission in the South American division. I was the president of the Central West Argentine Mission, a small territory with little money. We were dependent on the Argentine Union Conference to make ends meet. Pastor Kohler suggested that our contribution be determined by how many members we had. But not all conferences and missions have the same financial situation, I thought. Another problem was a difference between official church membership and the number who attend church regularly. In my mission, official membership was 10,000 people, but in reality, only 5,000 members went to church every Sabbath. I had to make a pledge. My heart pounded as I considered the issue. I knew the suggested contribution was high compared to the size of our budget. The mission treasurer was not with me to ask whether we could afford it. I didn't have much time to weigh the matter. With a prayer of faith, I pledged to donate the suggested amount for a territory with 10,000 members. Then I texted the treasurer, This is what we have to do. He immediately texted back, OK. He also wanted to support the project. Two weeks later, a big surprise awaited me in my office. A member unexpectedly sold some property and returned a large tithe. The tithe amounted to three times more than the funds we had given to the division's missionary initiative. I firmly believe the first person who benefits from the act of giving is the giver. The South American Division's missionary initiative ended up blessing church members in the Central West Argentine Mission most of all. 
And there's a photo here of Horatio Rizzo, who served as president of the Central West Argentine Mission for nearly three years before being appointed president of the River Plate Adventist University in Argentina in 2016. Three married couples who graduated from the university serve as missionaries in the Missionaries to the World initiative. This week's lesson has been read by Dr. Percy Harold from Queensland, Australia. It is brought to you by Hope Channel, the Sabbath School Department, and through the services of Christian Services for the Blind. A video of this podcast also occurs on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.